The year is 1876, and Mexico has been in chaos for over 50 years. After gaining its independence in 1821, the Mexican state had been embroiled in numerous wars against the Spanish, Americans, and French, and had seen a revolving door of leaders who often violently toppled their predecessors. This half-century of turmoil would leave Mexico in ruins, financially destitute, and missing over half of its territory. But by 1876, Mexico was ready to rebuild. With the ascension of Porfirio Diaz to the presidency in the fall of that year, Mexico would see its first stable ruler since independence, beginning an era that would reap much-needed rewards for the beleaguered nation while also sowing the seeds of future conflict. Porfirio Diaz was a Mexican general who, in keeping with Mexican tradition, violently overthrew the US-backed liberal government that preceded him. Even though Diaz had taken the presidency through force of arms, he did legitimately win the subsequent election of 1877. Promising to put an end to despotic rule in Mexico, Diaz amended the Mexican constitution soon after taking office to ban the re-election of presidents in the country. Seemingly keeping his promise, Diaz stepped down from the presidency in 1880. Mexico appeared to be taking its first steps toward legitimate democracy, but not everything was as it seemed. Manuel Gonzalez, the man who succeeded Diaz as president, turned out to be little more than a puppet for the former ruler, who would return to power himself in 1884, breaking his own ban against re-election. The media scandal that followed may have proved problematic for lesser politicians, but for Diaz, the solution was simple enough. He threw the press in jail and legalized unlimited re-elections. In the end, Porfirio Diaz would rule Mexico for over 30 years. While he stayed in power through unsavory means, Diaz's presidency was not uniformly bad for Mexico. Under his rule, Mexico's oil, textile, and mining industries blossomed, and foreign investment poured into the country. Mexican industry was further aided by explosive growth of the railroad, which occurred under Diaz's supervision. This extra economic activity allowed Diaz to pay off Mexico's external debt, which had plagued the nation since its founding. Diaz also oversaw the reconciliation of the Mexican state, church, and landowners whose distaste for each other had led to conflicts in the past. Before we continue, a special thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Star Trek Fleet Command, a free-to-play mobile game for iOS and Android that lets you interact with various iconic characters from Star Trek The Original Series, The Next Generation, Discovery, and other important entries in the Star Trek universe. Step into the shoes of your favorite Starfleet officer, customize and command legendary vessels like the Enterprise or the Klingon Bird of Prey, and engage with various storylines, including the new immersive Kelvin timeline. Enjoy the game's stunning graphics and breathtaking space-based visuals by engaging in real-time epic combat and explore an open, vast, and diverse galaxy. This year is Star Trek Fleet Command's fifth anniversary, and to honor the game's legacy and celebrate the dedicated player community that has made this award winning MMO game Endure and Thrive from now until November 28th, they're holding special contests, experiences, giveaways, and in-game events. Support our channel and celebrate this event by clicking our link in the description or scanning the QR code to sign up for Star Trek Fleet Command for free and use promo code WARPSPEED to receive a free content pack that includes legendary captain James T. Kirk. Under the surface of these successes, however, Diaz was making enemies. While his centralization of Mexico brought some benefits, it also curtailed the power of individual Mexican states, displeasing many local elites. From the perspective of everyday people, Diaz's reign also had issues, as it saw the massive expansion of haciendas, large rural estates that pushed Mexican peasants off their land and compelled them to work as unskilled laborers. Additionally, even though the foreign investment that Diaz attracted helped Mexico grow economically, it also meant that very little of Mexico's industry was actually owned by Mexicans. One by one, as these tensions mounted, Mexico inched ever closer to a breaking point. That breaking point finally came in 1910, after Diaz, who had previously announced that he would be stepping down from the presidency, promptly changed his mind and jailed the leader of the opposition, Francisco Madero. 
Unfortunately for Diaz, Madero, a wealthy landowner and son of a governor, managed to escape to the United States. Temporarily out of Diaz's reach, Madero called for the Mexican people to rise up on November 20th, 1910, the day the Mexican Revolution had begun. In the north of the country, Madero joined forces with Pancho Villa, a former bandit and horse thief, and began fighting against federal troops. In the south, peasant revolutionary Emiliano Zapata began his own rebellion inspired by Madero's promises of land redistribution. In this increasingly hostile environment, federal forces faced numerous defeats at the hands of Madero, Villa, and Zapata, motivating Diaz to step down to prevent further bloodshed, exiling himself to France in May of 1911. Soon after Diaz's departure, Madero was elected president of Mexico. After less than a year of fighting, the age of Porfirio Diaz had been brought to an end. This bright new age of Mexican history ran into problems almost immediately. While Madero and much of the middle class wanted electoral and economic reforms, they did not want extreme revolution. However, Madero's hope for a limited revolution had become increasingly untenable as decades of simmering discontent boiled over, and the revolution began to slip out of his control. In his call for revolution in 1910, Madero had promised land redistribution to the poor, but with armed farmers now roaming much of the Mexican countryside, Madero demanded that the peasants disarm before any land distribution went forward. This perceived betrayal was taken especially poorly by Emiliano Zapata, who rose up against Madero in 1912. In response, Madero would send one of his generals, Victoriano Huerta, to put down Zapata's rebellion, which would prove easier said than done. By early 1913, with battles still raging against Zapata in the south and the chaos of the revolution still uncontained, support for Madero began to falter. The United States began to worry that the instability in Mexico would be dangerous for their business interests in the country, and began to wonder if their interests would be better served if someone else was in charge. Someone like Victoriano Huerta. As it turns out, Huerta didn't need much convincing. In an agreement signed at the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City, the United States and Huerta agreed that Madero would be deposed in a coup, which ended up leading to the death of Mexico's first revolutionary. Madero was gone, and Huerta now assumed the Mexican presidency, all according to plan. What was not according to plan was Huerta's alcoholism and poor administrative skills. This unfortunate combination of traits led to vocal opposition to his rule almost immediately. Chief among these critics was Venustiano Carranza, the governor of the state of Coahuila. On March 26, 1913, Carranza went from critic to rebel when he called for the removal of Huerta and launched an armed uprising from his base in the north of the country. In this endeavor, Carranza was joined by Pancho Villa, who had spent the previous years amassing a sizable force, and newcomer Alvaro Abregon, who was appointed by Carranza to lead his army in the north. With the addition of Zapata's peasant army in the south, this new revolutionary alliance sought to surround Huerta and forcibly remove him from power. In more bad news for Huerta, the United States, despite backing his original coup less than a year prior, switched sides and threw in their lot with Carranza's alliance. Huerta was slowly being backed into a corner, but he wasn't defeated yet, and fierce fighting continued into 1914. Huerta's situation soon grew untenable, however, as American troops occupied the port of Veracruz following a diplomatic dispute, and Carranza, Villa, Abrigón, and Zapata closed in on Mexico City. Under this immense pressure, Huerta would resign on June 15, 1914, and flee into exile, ironically, into the United States. With Huerta gone, the revolutionary leaders now had to decide how they would rule Mexico. Carranza, as the instigator of the rebellion, took the risk of declaring himself president-elect, but in order to reduce tensions, also called for a meeting where Villa, Abrigón, Zapata, and him could all discuss their differences. However, this meeting was destined to fail. 
Villa and Zapata, who came from poorer backgrounds than Carranza and Abregón, wanted immediate social programs and agrarian reforms to placate their largely peasant following. On the other hand, Carranza and Abregón favored more long-term political reforms. These differences proved impossible to reconcile, and the alliance between the four men shattered, with Villa and Zapata launching yet another insurrection with the aim of toppling Carranza and his ally Abregón. Rapid advances by Villa and Zapata's rebelling forces pressed Carranza and Abregón to abandon Mexico City and flee to Veracruz, which by this point had been vacated by the Americans. By December 1st of 1914, Zapata and Villa had entered Mexico City, but neither of them felt qualified to govern the country, and they wasted precious time deciding on a course of action, which allowed Carranza and Abregón to regroup and take back the capital. The following months would be characterized by brutal fighting in the center of the country, although neither side managed to achieve a significant breakthrough. This would change during the second half of 1915. In the south, Carranza sent forces to combat Zapata's peasant bands and slowly began pushing Zapata back to his home state of Morelos. On the northern front, Abregón warded off an offensive by Villa near the town of Celaya. Abregón, a skilled general, was well prepared for Villa's now famous frontal cavalry attacks and fortified his positions with barbed wire and machine gun nests, tactics reminiscent of the then ongoing First World War. Abregón would then go on to defeat Villa in two more battles, forcing the horse thief turned revolutionary to retreat to his home turf in northern Mexico. His army shattered, Villa blamed his predicament on the Americans, who had been backing Carranza and Abregón for some time. In retaliation, Villa led an expedition against the U.S., attacking the border town of Columbus, New Mexico. After a short skirmish, both Villa and the now-enraged Americans claimed victory. A day after the raid, American President Woodrow Wilson dispatched General John Pershing to hunt down Pancho Villa. Despite the superiority of the American forces, Villa led Pershing on a wild goose chase across northern Mexico and evaded capture, eventually forcing the Americans to return home empty-handed. Despite this apparent victory, Villa was no longer the force he used to be, and soon took a back seat in the conflict, leaving his alliance with Zapata and containing himself in his home state of Chihuahua. With his power seeming increasingly secure, Carranza drafted a new Mexican constitution in 1917, the first in the world to set out social rights such as the eight-hour workday, maternity leave, and the right to strike. Carranza scored a further victory in 1919 when he successfully assassinated Emiliano Zapata, bringing an end to his rebellion in the South. Though small-scale fighting was still ongoing throughout Mexico, Carranza appeared to be nearing total victory. However, as Carranza was securing notable political victories and consolidating his power, he also began to alienate his closest ally, Alvaro Abregón. Abregón had been put off by many of Carranza's reforms and felt like he was being gradually pushed to the sidelines of Mexican politics. The final straw came in 1920, when Carranza chose to nominate an obscure diplomat as his chosen successor instead of Abregón. This slight proved too much for Abregón, who promptly launched what proved to be the final coup of the Mexican Revolution. With the army at his back, Abregón stormed Mexico City, forcing Carranza to flee to Veracruz once again. However, Abregón's former ally would never reach his destination. Somewhere along the road to Veracruz, Carranza was shot. The exact circumstances of his death are still debated today. Alvaro Abregón would rule Mexico from 1920 to 1924, before turning over power to a trusted ally, just as he wished Carranza had done. During his rule, Abregón would pass numerous reforms and provide the country with much-needed stability after years of bloodshed. Rumors spread that he was behind the assassination of a retired rancher in northern Mexico by the name of Pancho Villa. Of the four revolutionaries of 1913, only Abregón remained. This dubious honor was not to last, however, as Abregón himself would be assassinated just a few years later by a disgruntled Catholic fanatic, a violent end to a violent revolution. 
In the decade of bloodshed, more than a million Mexicans had lost their lives. The immense human tragedy of the revolution also drove countless Mexicans to flee to the United States in search of safety and a better life. Political developments of the Mexican Revolution would also continue to reverberate into the modern era. After his assassination in 1928, Alvaro Obregón's allies would form a political party that would come to be known as the PRI, ruling Mexico until the year 2000. Perhaps most importantly though, Carranza's constitution of 1917 not only served as inspiration for both Weimar Germany and the Soviet Union's own documents, but it continues to be used in Mexico to this day. So, with every politician sworn in, every law passed, and every vote counted, the legacy of the Mexican Revolution lives on.